Hi everyone, my name is Ed and I would like to welcome you to our first Meet a Physicist with the East Midlands branch of the Institute of Physics. Now I'm really lucky because I'm currently in the Science Centre of Green's Windmill in Nottingham. Now Green's Windmill is just a normal windmill, it was built hundreds of years ago, but at Green's Windmill, um, a very famous physicist was born, someone called George Green. Um, and George Green came up with loads of really important laws of physics, so ways that the natural world behaves. Um, and it's my pleasure today in this location to introduce you to some fantastic physicists as well. So I'm joined by, and I'm going to turn my camera around now. I'm joined by Deb, and I'm joined by Becky, um, and they are going to tell you exactly what they do as physicists, um, and then we're going to give you the opportunity to ask some questions, so you can either type those questions in or get someone to help you type those questions in, and we're going to answer all of those questions for you, hopefully. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let Deb and Becky tell us what kind of stuff they do. Thank you. Okay, so uh, hello, I am Deb. Um, it's really nice to meet all you rainbows and brownies, guides, rangers, young leaders, leaders, and the parents as well. Um, um, I am a physicist, although actually I studied physics and maths. So sometimes I feel like a physicist and sometimes more like a mathematician. And actually my job title says that I'm an engineer. So I feel a bit of a mix of all of them. And you might have noticed I'm also wearing my Girl Guiding Leader top because I'm also a brown app, a, a fantastic brownie group in Nottingham. Um, so I'm kind of a yeah, mix of things. But then I thought I would introduce myself, I might say. I also really love running and swimming, making stuff, I love the seaside, um, I like eating cake and biscuits. Um, so I was really excited to get involved with helping create the badge because it combines the girl guiding that I love and the physics that I love and if you're doing the badge or you're looking forward to doing the badge there is some making in there and there is also a biscuit option in the investigation. So, um, yeah, it's a really good badge. I've done it with my brownies, and we came to visit Green's Mill as part of the badge. And we dressed up as our favourite physicist when we came here. So I tried to dress up as George Green. I had a kind of yellow waistcoat on. Um, and the mill even let us do some of the activities in the yard. So we were launching rockets and things outside, which was good fun. Um, Unfortunately, I had twisted my ankle, so I didn't get to go up the mill, but all the brands did, and I've been back since to visit, so I recommend it as a good visit. Um, so I wanted to tell you about, I've done four different jobs um, that are kind of engineering, maths, the physics -y, um, and I was going to tell you about a little bit about all of them to give you an idea, because I didn't really know what job I was aiming for. I just studied physics and maths because they were the ones that I enjoyed. So my first job, I was working for a company called Kinetic um, and they were by the sea in Weymouth. They make um, submarines and uh, underwater vehicles. So they wanted to know about how sound travels through the water. Um, and if you've ever tried sitting in the bottom of the swimming pool and trying to sing to your friends, which I've done with my sister, you'll know that it sounds very different underwater than it does through the air. So um, they did some trials, I don't know if this will work, but we had a lock in Scotland and they set up two barges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we sent signals between them and then we wanted to measure everything that might affect how the sound travels so that I then, my project was to try and uh, get some maths 
to model that so we could put in some different signs and we could know what it was going to be like. So I don't know if you're looking at the picture, you can think of anything that might affect how the sound travels. But we've got the depth from the barge to the bottom, the distance between them, what, it's, what the bottom is made of, because sometimes the sound bounces off the bottom, sometimes it bounces off the top. So we have this guy here who we called Bob. He's a wave rider and he told us how wavy it was on the top because that makes a difference. Uh, we measured the temperature, we measured how salty it was and all those things went in so then we could predict. We knew the different uh, variables, we could then predict how the sound would travel. And it was a really good place to work because it, this is a picture of from the top here. So they had lots of things they wanted to test and this is all the sea. So sometimes in the summer when it was uh, warm, I got to go swimming at lunchtime. So that's job number one. Job number two, I work for a boil logging company. So they make these really long tools that just look like long balls of um, metal. They run them off the back of a truck. So a long wire off the back of a truck. A borehole is just a big, really deep hole that they've dug in the ground. We put them down on the wire and we gradually pull it up and we're taking measurements as we pull them up. And again, we use sound for that because the sound travels differently if the rocks are full of oil or if the rocks are full of water. And we wanted to know where the oil was. And we did something similar with some electrical tools too. So sending a circuit through, again, it travels differently through oil than water. Um, and similar in that we wanted to know what variables. So sometimes you get this kind of gunk mud cake they called it up the side of the borehole and so we also had to measure the depth of that because that would affect our measurements so yeah that was job two job three was um for a company that made a maternal and fetal heart monitor so uh, it was electrodes that went on mum's stomach and then we're taking measurements for heart rate and I was looking at trying to tell the difference between uh, movement and contractions so that we could keep uh, yeah, mum and baby safe. So all different, yeah, similar sort of skills, but in different industries. And now job number four, I work at Rolls-Royce. They don't make cars anymore. I don't know if you know what they do make. My picture to give you a clue. Um, they make the engines to go on aeroplanes. So you might have seen them and you get to go on holiday abroad. This is a slice through one and you can see there are loads and loads of different components, loads of different bits that go up to make that engine. Um, and my job here is looking at um, trying to predict when we need to replace them so that we've got enough spares in so that we can plan when they're gonna come into shop um, and so we can keep them flying safely. And again, there's different things that affect that. So some planes fly over the desert and our engine gets full of sand and that makes a big difference. Or they fly in hot places or cold places. And so we try to take all that into account. And I just wanted to show you my favorite bit of the engine. This is a high pressure turbine blade. It sits in the really hot bit in the center of the engine and um, it is 1,600 degrees in there. Um, so actually that's like putting an ice cube into the oven and turn it on to cook your pizza. What would happen to that ice cube? You'd expect it to melt probably. It wouldn't stay an ice cube very long. And really that's what should happen to this blade because it's so hot there but it doesn't melt because it's got a uh, really clever cooling. So we've got holes that kind of go up here, flows up through the blade and comes out uh, on the surface here. Um, and also sometimes we coat them as well to keep them cool so it can do its job. Um, this blade is one of about 40. This is the bit we call the fir tree. If you see, it looks a bit like a fir tree. Uh, and that slots in around a big disc and it spins around. Uh, I think it goes in every second, it would go past your nose 200 times. So that's my 
Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Deb. That's very exciting. Um, and next we have Becky. Hello. Okay, I'm Becky, um, and I'm also a physicist, uh, but I'm a very different kind of physicist. I'm really glad I came, I went second, because I can just follow the format of what you did. Um, so uh, you talked about what you did at university. I started out doing um, physics at university. I did spend quite a long time wishing I'd done maths, um, but I'm really glad now that I stuck with the physics. Um, and then uh, one of the things that I chose to do uh, towards the end of my university um, degree was that I chose to go towards medical physics. Um, so uh, the first sort of project, it was it was just like a, a project as part of my learning at university, part of my degree um, that I did in medical physics um, was uh, on medical modeling. So this is like trying to make mathematical models um, about how the body works so that we can understand in a lot more detail how the body does the things it does, which are just so amazingly complicated. Um, and then also trying to understand what happens when that goes wrong or trying to change the system so that it's less likely to go wrong. Um, and so what I was looking at was trying to understand how the heart beats. So um, uh, you might know that um, the heart is caused to beat through electrical activity. You've probably seen on like casualty or hobby city or something, somebody having paddles put on their chest um, that's to change the electrical activity in the heart. Um, and so one of the things I was modeling was that electrical activity in a healthy heart so that we know what that should look like to try and get it to go back to that. Um, and then after that, I uh, went on to do a PhD um, and that, that was in a university as well. Um, but doing a PhD is basically just like doing a job in research, um, except at the end, you have to write a book about your job um, and someone gives you a PhD, um, but it, it is very similar to, to doing any old job in research um, while you're learning uh, all of the skills that you need to do that job properly. Um, and that was when I started using MRI scanners. Now MRI scanners, MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging, um, and that's lots of complicated words which I'm going to go through in a minute, but basically it's just taking pictures inside your body um, so as you know, your body is all nice and um, uh, you've got skin covering every bit of your body and so you can't easily get into, say, the middle of your brain because um, like, you can go in your mouth, but then like, the top of your mouth in the way. So if we want a picture of your brain, um, we don't want to have to slice your body open because then you wouldn't survive it. So I want to take a nice picture of your brain um, without hurting your head and I use an MRI scanner. Um, and uh, this is technology that um, has been developed quite a lot um, here in Nottingham, so it's really exciting to be in Nottingham, um, what we call the home of MRI, although that's not entirely accurate. Um, and so uh, one of the things that was done in Nottingham was making MRI scans a lot faster. Um, so MRI scans would take 10, 20, 30 minutes, and those sorts of pictures you can now do in maybe two or three or four seconds. So it's, it's quite a fast process. Um, and I mostly do MRI scanning of the brain. Oh, I was going to explain what MRI was first. So magnetic resonance imaging. So um, magnetic is like the magnets on your fridge. It's exactly the same kind of magnetic. Um, and if you think of you put a magnet on the fridge door and it stays there. And um, that's because there's an attraction between the magnet and the metal on your fridge door. Um, and that's because uh, the um, atoms and molecules and stuff that are in the magnet are somehow talking to, interacting with um, the, the, the atoms and the molecules in your fridge door. Um, and the MRI scanner itself is a really big magnet um, and it can, it can interact um, with your body in a way that's completely harmless. I mean, I've been in the scanner like over 200 times um, and I'm fine. Um, and, uh, and so it, it interacts with your body in, in a similar kind of way, it, it sort of it talks to the, uh, the atoms and the molecules um, in a way that we can use to, to make a picture. Um, the resonance bit, now this one's a bit more complicated. So if you get a glass of water and you lick your finger, or get your finger wet and you run it around the top of the glass, you can hear, you can, if you do it really well, you can make a sound. Um, and that sound is called resonance. And basically we get all the atoms and molecules in your body to do that, 
in a really, really cool way using radio waves. Um, and imaging is just about making an image, so making a picture rather than just getting some squiggly lines back that we can't make any sense of. Um, we make an actual image, like if you were taking a photograph of something on your phone. Um, and similarly, we, we've got lots of really good ways of knowing how to reconstruct that picture. So um, uh, the MRI scanner, let's think of it just as a big, really, really expensive camera. Um, and imagine you've got a flash on that camera um, uh, and instead of it just being a white flash, like you've probably got on your, your camera or your phone or your mom's phone, um, this camera has a very funky flash, um, which is all rainbow colours. So you've got the, rain, the, the flash is like a rainbow that um, fills the area of the room that you're taking a picture of. Um, so you've got your red stripes, orange, yellow, green, blue, purpley mess at the end. Um, and uh, what the MRI scanner does is it uses the information that says, I know the red light went that way, so when I get that bit of the picture back, I know that it goes in that bit of the picture, and it knows that for every single um, part of the image that it's reconstructing, and so it can get all of that information back together, super fast time, and reconstruct it into a picture. Um, and so we're using that now every single day in hospitals. MRI is a really, really important tool for working out what's going on in the body um, and uh, what potentially is going wrong with the body and how we can fix it. And really importantly, once we've tried helping um, somebody, maybe by giving um, some surgery or some medicine, doing something to make them better, we can then monitor in that person, do they continue to get better? Are they um, continuing to improve or do we need to give them more medicine or do something else um, to, to continue to help fixing the problem. So MRI is a really important tool because it's completely safe. It's way safer than things like x-rays and CT scans. Um, and it means that we can take lots and lots of pictures of your body um, and uh, use them to um, help us decide um, whether you're healthy or whether there's anything we can do um, to improve your health. Um, and then quite a lot of the research that I'm doing with MRI at the moment is understanding how the brain works. So um, you know that you've got blood being pumped around your body um, and the main job of the blood is to take oxygen from your heart to all the parts of your body that need oxygen. Um, and your brain needs oxygen as much as, well, more oxygen, more oxygen than any other part of your body, but brain consumes a lot of the oxygen. Um, and so your blood takes the oxygen to your brain and drops off the oxygen in your brain uh, where your brain is um, being active at that point in time. So if you're listening to some sounds, then your auditory, your hearing cortex will be responding. If you're uh, moving your arms and legs around, then your motor, your movement cortex will be responding. Um, and there's lots of other different parts of the brain. So maybe if you're looking at something, some video, some visual, then your visual cortex will be responding. Um, and there's hundreds of different parts of the brain that we're trying to understand what they all do. And I can use MRI by working out, um, by uh, making, taking lots and lots of images successively um, to um, understand which parts of the brain are using up more blood. Um, so how does that work? Uh, well, I'll go back to what I was telling you about um, uh, your brain using the blood that is um, taken up through your blood vessels from your heart. Um, and the, uh, uh, the deoxygenated blood, so the blood, once it's dropped off the oxygen, um, changes magnetically a little bit, and we can see those changes. Um, and so what I would get somebody to do is to lie in an MRI scanner, they'll be lying flat, probably on their back with some headphones on, listening to some nice music. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll have a screen up in front of them where I can give them instructions. And so one of the experiments that we do quite a lot is um, getting someone to tap their fingers because the part of the brain that controls tapping your fingers is actually quite a big part of your brain because it's really important that we have, um, that we can do lots of really detailed, complex things with our fingers. As you know, you're using your hands all the time to do everything. So there's a large bit of the brain that's, that's associated with, that's taken up with controlling how you move your fingers to do um, interesting and complicated things. So we'll have this person lying in the MRI scanner and I'll tell them on the screen, tap your fingers, and then I'll tell them, stop tapping your fingers. And all throughout that whole time, I'll be taking a picture of their brain every two seconds. And then I can use all of those pictures stacked up together. 
to work out which parts of the brain were um, controlling tapping your fingers. And those are the sorts of experiments that I do um, day in, day out at the university. Um, I've been working at the university for about 12 years now. So um, that's how long I've been doing research. Um, so about three years of that was my PhD. And then about nine years since then, I've been doing um, postdoc jobs in the university. Um, and uh, the idea is that I, I design experiments and I run experiments by getting people in to come and do my experiments for me. And then I write up all of the data and I write a paper and I get that published in a magazine or something. And then everyone else can read about what I do. So that's basically my job. And I think we'll have over. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Deb. And thank you so much, Becky. That was a really nice introduction. We have actually got some questions coming in already, oh, some really good questions. And I'm actually, I'm going to start with one that's not quite a question from Emmy, who's six. And she's pointed out that she had an MRI today oh, wow. and listened to Little Mix inside. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Which is really exciting. No, that's good. Yeah, you can take along your CD and listen or put your phone in. No one uses CDs anymore, do they? <laughs> Lots of CD. <laughs> That's really exciting, Amy. Thank good. you for sharing. Um, so we have got some questions as well, and I'm, I'm going to start with um, a, a very, very good question, um, which is from um, Molly. Um, and Molly's wondering who inspired you to get where you are today. Is there someone that inspired you? Great oh, question. My teachers. I think I had a really good, uh, enthusiastic sixth and maths teacher with the school, and they, yeah, were happy to answer all of my many questions. <laughs> yeah, definitely my teacher. Cool. I think for me, um, I remember watching the Royal Institution Christmas lectures on television, a little series of lectures that's on every December or like late December, early January. Um, and they used to be on the BBC. I think they are on the BBC again. You know, they've taken a route around other channels and I remember watching those lectures particularly and um, wanting to use big fancy equipment and do exciting things and travel to different places and I remember there was one lecturer called Susan Greenfield um, and she did lots of work on the brain and understanding the brain and um, I think that was probably what inspired me to be a scientist. Cool. It would be great as well. So you don't have to always ask questions. Maybe you can tell us who inspires you as well. And we'll see if we know who they are or maybe it's your teachers or, or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, or Little Mix, maybe. And um, we have got a, another question from Molly from Ed Walton. Um, and this was, I believe, when Deb was telling us all about her different jobs. Um, she has said, what do you want to do next? Oh, good question. <laughs> I enjoy my job at the moment. I don't think I've actually, I don't think it was ever a plan that I would do <laughs> lots of jobs. It just sort of happened that I was, yeah, find new things that I was interested in. And like the first job was just while I was studying. So it was just for a year. And then I went back to study before I found another job. Um, yeah, now I'm. I'm enjoying my job, so I think I'm going to stick with that for now. Um, but yeah, it's good. I don't know. I think uh, I've enjoyed working at Rolls Royce, and particularly in the uh, group that I'm in, we get to see all different bits of the engine. So maybe just yeah, finding out a bit more um, about other bits of the engine as well. Awesome. And um, the, the questions are really coming in now. These are some really, really good questions. Um, I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with a question that's come up next, and um, which is, are there many ladies working in your field? Um, my, uh, specifically in my uh, group at work, there's about 20 of us, four of which are female, um, but there are lots of other females within Rolls Royce as well. Not as many as males, but there are lots of. Um, so I work in the university physics department, um, and I, as I said before, I work in a medical imaging part of the physics department. So I think in the university physics, there are probably not very many ladies, maybe 
one in 10. So maybe if there's 50 people in the department, there's maybe five ladies there. But in um, my, my close department on uh, medical physics, I'd say there's, there's probably more than half of us are female. I think there's probably, um, yeah, about 60% females in my group. Um, and, and I think one of the things um, I want to mention, I guess, in relation to that is that nobody really does physics or no one does any science entirely on their own. So um, one of the really big things that has probably changed about science in the last couple of generations is that um, all science is done now in multidisciplinary teams. So anytime I'm going to um, maybe I'm going to a meeting to design a big new experiment that we're going to do, like imagining what we might be doing after lockdown or something like that. Um, I'm not just a physicist doing a job in a team of physicists. I'm the physicist in a team um, where there is a biochemist and a um, physiologist and a neuroradiologist and lots of people that do lots of different aspects of science but we don't all do the same thing. And the reason that we make such an excellent team is because we can bring all of our skills together and do something really amazing with that. So there's not a lot of women in physics at the moment, although we're working really, really hard to improve those numbers, but actually scientists work together across all areas of science. Um, and I think there is a really good spread of, of ladies doing all kinds of science. Perfect, thank you. Um, the next one is, is, you know, almost, I don't know whether it is the most uh, important question. Do you like your job? Yeah, yeah, good. I think there are some days I might like it less, but most of the time, yes. I like my job. I like, yeah, I like, it is good. Uh, I get to talk to lots of people in lots of different teams. Um, I get to learn lots of new things. It is challenging and I like that. Um, yeah. Yes, I absolutely love my job. Um, trying to think, my, I think my, probably my favourite part of my job um, is uh, I get um, people from the general public. So anybody like you or your ones or your leaders or your carers, anybody from the general public to come in and take part in my experiments and help me with my science. Um, and so I, I get to put them in the MRI scanner and show them some pictures of their brain. Um, and that's so exciting. And I, and I have the, I actually have the time to sit there and say this bit of your brain does that. And I'm looking at this area. Um, and that's really, really cool because everyone's really excited to see a picture of their brain. Um, and I think it's really important also to sort of understand how all the medical imaging techniques work at a time where um, you're healthy and relaxed about it and so it's it's super exciting to um, explain all these things to people while they're really healthy and happy to be taking part in experiments. Um, so yes, I do love my job. Perfect. And, and that was from Neve at First West Bridgeford. Oh, thank so you. So that, that was worth a shout out <laughs> as well for that great question. <clears throat> and do you think if you didn't like your job, so you've had four jobs, Deb. Yeah. If you didn't like your job, would you do it? <laughs> um, if I didn't like my job, I think I'd find a different job that I did like more. Yeah. Maybe. Good. Um, so I've, I've got a really good question here as well. And I, I don't know whether this one is mainly to Becky because you've okay. talked a lot about it, but actually it would be great to hear if everyone has a favourite part of the brain. Oh, favourite part of the brain? Oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think rather than have a favourite part of the brain, I think I've got a favourite fact about the brain, I guess, which is a little bit like, well, you'll see, you'll see how this will work. So the brain is really organised. That's my favourite fact of the brain, because um, all the parts of the brain are filed away just in the perfect place so that the brain can find it when it's in a hurry. Um, so the visual cortex is organised like the world that we see. It's organised like our visual field. It's wrong way up and it's a slightly different filing system. But if you wanted to find the part of the brain that controlled up here, you can find that part of the brain in the back of your head. If you wanted to find the part of the brain that controlled down here, you can find that in your head. Um, the, the touch and uh, motor 
um, parts of the brain. They're all really well organized as well. So you've got little strips going down the side of the brain from the very top down to just above your ears. Um, and they're organized by the part of your body and they rank them in order. So as I said, your hands probably take up the most, your face takes up a lot as well. Your feet, they're considered less important. Um, so so the, the body ranks those parts of the brain, um, parts of the body in order. So it's again, really, really organized. So if you wanted to find like your left middle toe, then you can find that in the brain. And then the other part, another part of the brain, most of the brain does this as well, but another part of the brain that's really organized is the, the hearing part of the brain. Um, and across the, we call it the auditory cortex, because auditory is hearing. And across the auditory cortex, that is organized by, um, by frequency, by pitch. So like the keys on a piano going from really, really low up to really, really high, um, and all the way in between. And um, I think that's just perfect. So all, all the parts of the brain are amazing, um, but I think the fact that it's so organized is cool. <laughs> just imagine a little filing system. It is, it's filing within my brain. Um, is there a bit of my brain that, which is the bit of my brain then that gets excited when I eat cake and biscuits? Oh, there is. I can't remember where it is. It's somewhere right in the middle. Um, uh, but yeah, there's there's a part of the brain that makes you want to eat really fatty, calorific <laughs> things. Um, actually, one one of my um, one of my PhD supervisors, someone I've worked with for like twelve years, she's absolutely brilliant. Um, she she did some research and she was on um, a documentary on telly. I think she was on Horizon actually, okay. talking about this bit of the brain. Um, and she put some people in an MRI scanner and she made them drink like double cream and then single cream. And then like full fat milk and then like skimmed milk and you can see that this part of the brain responds differently to each of them oh. and it responds most to the full fat cream and least to the, the skimmed milk and it's really really cool so yes there's parts there is a part of your brain that is saying eat lots of fatty things <laughs> just imagine it doing a little dance yeah it does, <laughs> it does. It does. It does. amazing so actually there's a there's a question that follows on again it's okay. about the brain and this is from Isla, um, who's from First West Bridgeford Brownies. And um, what percentage of her brain <coughs> would she be using playing a game? Oh, wow. OK, that's a really good question. So a lot of people think that we don't use all of our brains. Um, I, all of the brain is functioning all of the time. So your brain is healthy and well, and it's making new cells, and it's using up oxygen. So all of the brain is being used, um, and it's more just that that um, the brain likes to send signals between different areas of the brain. So if you're playing a game, you're going to be moving. So you're certainly using some of the motor, you're certainly sending signals between some of the motor areas. Um, we have uh, lots of areas in the very front of your head that you might be using to um, do some calculations. So like work out what number you need to roll if you're going to overtake your brother or work out which cards you should keep back for the next round because you need to beat dad or something like that. Um, so that, so a lot of that will be going on in the frontal cortex. You're always going to be using your visual cortex in the back um, because you're you know, taking information in from your world through your eyes and processing all of that. You might be using your auditory cortex to listen to how many times they're moving their cursor on the board to make sure they've got it right or trying to listen if they're collaborating and trying to understand what someone's whispering so that you can cheat um, or you might yeah you might be just listening to little mix while they're playing monopoly waiting for your turn to come around so actually you're using the vast majority of your brain all the time and it's more about which parts of the brain are sending signals to each other to help work things out to work out what your body's going to do next perfect thank you and um, we've got a, a great question here from Scarlett of the fourth Southall Brownies or Southwell Brownies, depending on where you're from. Um, it's, it's, do you have engineering or physics hobbies? Really good question, Scarlett. Well, so I guess it sort of depends on what a hobby is get involved in setting up the badge and doing some of the outreach we do with the Institute of Physics. Um, I love going and chatting to the different groups and um, setting up some, getting some science into some of my brownie activities as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, Friday's is my hobby, so I get to speak <laughs> in there. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was going to go down the outreach route because I spend a lot of my spare time just talking about all of the science that I do. Um, so I, there's a thing called Skeptics in the Pub or um, Pub HD. So there's lots of things where we, we can meet up and talk about all the different areas of science that everybody works in. Um, I do a bit of work with um, uh, people making policy, so like the government and trying to help them um, understand some of the research that we do. Um, I do a lot of work going into schools um, and talking just like we are now about different um, aspects of science and physics. Uh, so I guess I do a lot of a lot of science, a lot of physics in my spare time um, rather than as a hobby. It is a hobby. Visiting, uh, like visiting sciencey places. Oh yeah, for my own benefit. Yeah, I learn new stuff. Yeah, like I've come here for a day out. I bring friends when they're travelling to Nottingham and go look to look at this cool place that's going here tomorrow. And yeah, I love look around. I would say as well, it's definitely engineering and chemistry making a cake. <laughs> <laughs> making a cake. You're doing some baking. Yes, and a bit of magic. <laughs> um, so the questions are really coming in now. Um, okay. We've got a really good one here. How many people does it take to make an aeroplane engine? And that's from Neve, again oh, wow. from First West Bridgeford. I'm going to be honest, we don't actually know, <laughs> but there's a lot of people who are designing it. So there's a lot of people, I don't know if you just mean the building it, the fitting it all together, um, but there are a lot of people who get involved before that to design it. To, make sure that it's going to last as long as you want it to under the temperatures you want it to and then we've got to build it we've got to test it um i don't know how many people lots, lots. of people <laughs> and the time it takes you will have some people will have worked on this bit and then it will get shipped and then this bit and this bit will get put together um and some of the biggest ones actually we have to split in half to get it on the plane to transport it to the customer. So they're big. Mm, very big. And actually, this is something quite nice to point out, is that as a scientist, we don't always know the answers. No. In fact, it's it, we, we, we wouldn't be very good scientists if every question had already been answered. So we won't always know the answers, I'm afraid, but we can try. Um, so we've got a, a, a nice question here. So this is from Emmy. Um, what is your favourite fun experiment? And these are the ones in the pack. So the, the brownie patch pack. Okay. It's a great question. Okay. Um, I've still got my tame tornado set up at home. So that's the one where you've got two bottles kind of stuck together and you're trying to make the water go from one to the other as quickly as possible. So you've got water in one and air in the other, and then you tip it up, and the quickest way to do it is to give it a swirl. Ooh. Love doing that one. I've got two favourites for <laughs> different reasons. <laughs> All right, my favourite one is, um, is fizzy rockets. Um, so that's where you get um, like a fizzy effervescent vitamin C tablet, something like that. Um, and you crush it into powder and you put it in a little jar and put some water on top of that and then um, put a really airtight lid on it and then um, put it down and stand well back um, and then for uh, an unknown period of time you can just stare at it and hope that it'll explode and then it'll go pop and fly really high into the air and it's really fun and I really like that nobody knows quite how long it's going to take because it all depends um, on how finely you ground up the um, uh, the tablet and how much of the tablet you've got in there um, and on all sorts of things like the temperature of the air and everything will also um, play into uh, how long it can take to pop so you never know how long you've got to talk um, until it goes pop that's my favorite they get really high <laughs> they go really high yes we did them in, in, in the NEC which is like a really big um, like conference sensor that like, I don't know 30 meter ceiling or something um, and they, they got fairly high, fairly <laughs> near the ceiling. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, a question here, how old were you when you first knew you wanted to be a scientist? 
And under is that professional scientists? Would you say that you're scientists as soon as? Well, yes, that's a good philosophical <laughs> question. Yes. Yeah. But how old were you when you wanted to know? So when you when you knew you wanted to be? So yeah, that's that was an absolute answer to it. <laughs> So um I think I think yeah, going back to when I was watching the Royal Institution Christmas lectures, um I was probably about eight, nine, ten, something like that. But the sort of science that I wanted to do um changed like every couple of years. Like I'd I'd find out about a new science and go, Oh, this is the most exciting thing in the world, I want to do this. Um, and then some other new science would come out and I go, no, 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 this is the most exciting thing I want in the world, I want to do this. Um, but I think anyone who does some science is a scientist. So if you've done your, um, I'm a physicist badge, then while you're doing that badge, you're a physicist. Yeah, I don't have, I don't know what age, I don't think it was ever a plan. So it just, it just sort of happens. And actually, I know my mum said that when I was, probably about five, I actually wanted to be a lollipop lady or a traffic warden because the one I knew also helped people across the road. So maybe not then, I didn't think about being a scientist, but I don't know. Perfect. Um, so we've got some more technical questions about the brain coming oh, in. Bye. Seems everyone's quite excited about the brain. Um, we've got Loxley. Um, from the 10th Mansfield Brownies, um, asking very technical questions. Are surgeons able to fix any hearing problems using an MRI as a map? Oh, that's really interesting. Okay, so I'm going to unpick that to quite a few questions, actually. <laughs> so as a whole, your question, yes, really. Um, so when somebody has a hearing problem there could be all sorts of causes um, for it um, and if we know the cause of the hearing problem then there are things that can be done to try and fix that sometimes that will need surgery um, sometimes it can't be done by surgery um, people who have what we call sensory neural hearing loss um, which is just a certain kind of hearing loss um, if they um if we know that they would be helped by having a cochlear implant so that is um, an implant that's, that's surgically put into the ear um, and they put a little electrode into the cochlea so that's the snail shell part of your ear and the electrode goes into the cochlea um, and uh, it produces stimulation um, it sends all of the sounds that the microphone can hear um, it sends them as little electrical impulses right into the inner ear um, instead of your ear doing that. So it sort of bypasses how your ear works. Um, and they use an MRI scan to plan how they're going to do that surgery. So everyone's, everyone is, everyone's ear is very slightly different. They've got slightly different angles, slightly different arrangements, slightly different um, distances between things. So they will always use an MRI scan to plan how they're going to do that surgery because the, the device they put in is pretty much the same for everyone. So they need to be able to customize how they're going to do that. But actually, there's even more exciting things than that happening now, not necessarily to do with hearing, um, but other forms of brain surgery um, where they're, they're planning um, surgical um, sort of planning surgical routes through using an MRI scan. Um, and they can do that fairly much in real time now. So they can have somebody on an operating bed just literally outside the MRI scanner, do some operation, wheel them in about three feet get another picture, we'll three feet out again, do some more surgery. Um, and actually in Nottingham, we're having one of those scanners built right now. So that's really exciting. Um, so yes, basically, yes, on so many levels. <laughs> very, very good question, uh, Loxley. Very good question indeed. Um, we've got a, another question from Freya of First West Bridgeford Brownies. Is any of your brain working when you're asleep? Yes. Yes, so much of your brain is working when you're asleep. Um, so there are particular parts of the brain um, that, that like to work really hard when you're not thinking about anything. So they help you um, kind of process, I guess, what you've been going through in the day. We're not, we're not really sure why they do what they do. Again, this going back to what I just said about scientists don't know everything. We certainly don't know everything. And we know that there's loads of things about the brain that we don't know. 
um, and we don't really, really know um, why the brain is so active when you're not thinking about anything. Um, but then also during sleep, when you're dreaming, all those sorts of things, your brain will be working um, to a certain extent as much as if you were awake. Cool. I find if I try not to think of something, I always think of really weird things. <laughs> think that of a <laughs> like dream, yeah, like when I'm having a dream or something. Um, we've got a question from Scarlett, and um, just to follow on the the questions about um, about the brain, is there a scientific name for the brain? Yeah, I guess. Um, so the, the actual organ is the, um, uh, well, cortex is, is the organ that is your brain. The cerebrum is, is the whole uh, anatomical feature. And then you've got lots of little parts of the brain. So we like to label, there's a, there's a big motor highway that goes from the front of your brain to the back of your brain, which is called the corpus callosum. That takes up a lot of your brain. And there's a big chunk of your brain right at the back called the cerebellum, the little brain. Um, so we, we name lots of different parts of the brain. Um, wonderful. Um, and then we've got uh, Neve is asking, just to round off the questions yeah, about the brain. <laughs> um, what is the main thing that keeps your brain working? Oh, ev everything. I mean, we <laughs> blood, I guess. Um, so blood transports oxygen around the body and other nutrients, sugar, glucose. Um, Water, your brain couldn't work without water. Um, I think, yeah, probably water and oxygen. Oxygen may be more important. <laughs> Perfect. Wicked. So let's, uh, let's, let's change gears uh, and let's go to Isla's question. Isla, again, first at West Bridgeford Brownies. What is the most important part of a plane's engine? Oh, oh. Like the most important bit of the brain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you do, you do really need all of it. Um, the main bit that I guess you see are the really big fan blades at the front. Um, but then there's the casing. So it's, you you suck in the air, you squeeze it in the combustor, and you blow it out. And you need all of those bits really to survive. So would the engine not work if one of those bits was missing? Uh, there are, I guess, so I guess there are, we have sort of some bits that do the same bits as other bits, so you can cope for a while without some, say, so yeah, backup systems, um, and a lot of it would be efficiency, so you want it to be, you've been um, getting you there as quickly as possible and using as least fuel as possible, so you would lose efficiency, but you Okay, and that actually leads us really nicely into Scarlett's question. How long do you think it will be before there is an electric plane? Ooh. That is a great question. <laughs> um, I can't remember what the predictions on the years are. We're, it's something that people are looking at. The biggest problem is the weight of batteries at the moment. Um, but So we are looking at part electric and the things we can do on that so it isn't really working on don't let your power on okay okay fantastic um, so thinking about as physicists as you as physicists um did you like physics at school I did yeah i think that's why they I didn't. I didn't have a plan of what job I was going to do. I just chose the subject. And enjoyed it. Yeah, I did enjoy it. I didn't enjoy the physics I did in science classes at school, but I knew that there were parts of physics that I really did enjoy because I was really lucky that I I could read about physics in my spare time outside of school. So I'd get books and magazines um, about about physics that I really did enjoy, um, even though my science lessons were a bit boring. And then I would go, I would go to my science teacher and, and say, oh, I've been reading about this, can you tell me about this? And they'd be like, oh, Becky. Um, but um, yeah, so I think, I think the reason that I chose physics, um, certainly as like at the last few years of school was because that I knew there was loads more physics to come that was really exciting. 
um, that you do need all the physics that you do at school to be able to understand that stuff. Um, so just hold in your mind that it's going to get so much better. Ah, so that, that's good. So there, there is a question from Poppy in Loughborough who's uh, just asking, was physics hard? I found, I know I found maths really tough at primary school um, and I don't know, yeah, the original bit is necessarily, I've always found it easy, um, it's just been the thing I've enjoyed and I think if you choose the things you enjoy, you perhaps put more effort in and that helps. Yeah, I think I completely agree with that. I think I'll, I'll put it a slightly different way. I um, I found, I didn't find it easy to do, but I found it easy to motivate myself to do. Um, so like if there's a, I don't know, imagine a level of a computer game that you're really enjoying playing, maybe it frustrates you a bit because sometimes you keep dying and you lose all your lives and you have to go back to the beginning. Um, physics was a bit like that for me. Like I, I found it, quite hard, quite frustrating, but it was really easy to motivate myself to want to do it because I found it so exciting. Perfect. Perfect. Now we had a question earlier that was, are there many lady physicists where you work? We've had a question from Emmy uh, who's asking, is it hard being a girl scientist? I don't think it makes a difference. I really don't. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I don't feel like there is a difference then. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay. I think, yeah, I think it's I think it's really fun. Um, I feel like at the moment, actually, it's really exciting being a girl scientist because loads of people want to talk about girl scientists, <laughs> and now is a really fun time to be a girl scientist. But I think that's the only difference that I would notice. I don't think it's hard at all. To be a girl scientist. So Is it hard to be a boy scientist? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's none. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think about it, I guess. So you say lots of people come to speak to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. And I think I think possibly girl scientists get more people coming to speak to them about being girl scientists at the moment. Okay. Okay. Um We've got, um, what was the first type of engine? And I'm going to guess that this one's for Deb again. <laughs> what was the first type of engine that you worked on? Oh, um, so I do do bits work across quite a few. Um, the oldest ones are probably the ones I first that I worked on. So all the ones they've got um, at Rolls-Royce, they're all sort of Trent engines. They tend to be named after the rivers. So that's RB211s. And that's yeah. I don't know. I can't think what that stands for. RB two elevens, and there's five two fours and five three fives, and they are. I think they are still flying, but they're gradually coming out of service. Um, and now we're looking at the much bigger um, Trent XWB engines. Yeah. What sort of plane would they have been in? What? How has that changed over? Um. I don't know. So yeah, some I mean some planes have got four engines and some have got two. Um and we do yeah have that kind of mixture. Um the ones I work on are all what we call civil aerospace, so they're the ones sort of that you might go on holiday on, but then Rolls Royce also does ones for uh, defense as well, so they're a little bit different. Um military. Yeah, I, was, I guess I was thinking like, are they the sort of thing that you'd get from like London to Sydney or like London to Edinburgh or like Jay Z would have to go for <laughs> his home? <laughs> yeah, so we, well, we've got some that uh, they don't do many flights, but they're just owned by um, some royalty somewhere yeah. and they just use them for their odd flights. Yeah, Prince yeah. Harry's private. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then like, we are looking at uh, what we're calling ultra long range, so 18 hour flights. Which is a long time to sit on a plane. <laughs> wow. um, we have got, uh, just from Neve of First West Bridgeford, she's 
saying that her dad is an engineer who works for Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. Maybe you okay. know them, Deb. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Um, I would just point out at this point. So we've got five minutes left on this broadcast. So so the time's gone mm -hmm. really, really fast. And we have still got some um, questions, so we're going to try our best to answer the questions that have already come in. Um, but we, we're going to have to finish in five minutes. And we want to do more of these. Exactly. There's going to be more of these. Exactly. And if you do have any other questions, then there will be some kind of way, I'm sure, of us to for us to answer them. Yeah even if we don't necessarily know what that is right now. Um, <laughs> Find us on Twitter, that was one of the ways. So yeah. ho however you found out about this, get in touch with us again through that. So you might have you might have had an email address, you might have had Twitter, you might have had Facebook. So however you found out about this and got in touch with David or, or booked your um, ticket for this tonight, you can use that route again to try and get in touch with us. Perfect, thank you, Becky. Um, so we, we have got the, this uh, three questions up here. Um, the first one is, are your parents or anyone else in your family scientists? Oh. First scientist of the family, Deb. My dad um, uh, did sort of electrical stuff, so that's sort of science-y, but um, nobody else. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm afraid I've, I've had lots of scientists in my family. My, my grandpa um, did lots of work on x-rays, so he was in medical physics, although I didn't actually know that when I chose to do medical physics, which is always a joke. Um, and uh, my dad was a chemist. Um, so yes, lots of science in my family. Indeed. Um, uh, and another question, if you weren't a physicist, is there any other scientific or engineering jobs that you would like to do, and does it does it does it have to be um, just um, a scientific or engineering job? Maybe are there any other jobs full stop that you might like to do? I'd like to make my uh, lollipop lady dreams come true. <laughs> yeah, that's in the plan. Um, I don't know, it's such a mixture, and I, I have sort of chosen different jobs. I don't necessarily I feel that oh, this is a physics job or that's an engineering job. That's not the right word. Um, I am interested in the kind of medical and the stuff that helps people learn. I think you can that you can see being used. I think that's what attracted me to that. I think any other dream jobs came I like to do. Um, rapper. <laughs> baker. Yeah, baker. Cake taster. Something where I can, yeah, eat more cake and go swimming on the beach. Eat more cake and go swimming. Is that safe to eat cake and, and then go swimming? Maybe the other way around. <laughs> go the other way around. Go the other way around. I think for me, definitely, I would, uh, I would probably pick research as being most of the top jobs that I want to do. But then one of the jobs that comes with research, which is really, really closely intertwined, is talking about research. And so I do a lot of writing about different research, about other people's research, about my own research. I do a lot of talking about um, medicine to, to people in medicine and people in the government. And so I think I would want to carry on doing that. So. Okay. Uh, and probably our final question right now. Um, so, would you give any advice to someone who wanted to do physics as a girl for a job? It's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so, I think. Find something that you love and that you find easy to motivate yourself to do. Um, like I was saying in answer to one of the questions earlier, um, if you if you love what you're doing, you're going to be really good at it because you're going to want to, to work harder and to strive to be the best that you can. Um, I would say do all the things that um, that make what you're doing more fun. So spend that extra time reading around it. Go to some lectures. Go to a cool science museum. Um, go, go, go and do all the cool stuff that um, gives you added value 
to the science that you're doing um, and yeah just get a really broad experience of as much as you can yeah i think it is about doing the stuff you enjoy and i think yeah and you do well at the things you enjoy so i think that's in it yeah, yeah? fantastic okay so thank you so much for joining us for our Meet a Physicist event today. Um, you can find us on our Institute of Physics East Midlands branch Twitter page if you would like to ask us any further questions. And um, we have been broadcasting from Greens Mill Science Center in Nottingham, which sadly is still closed because of the viral outbreak, but it's quite an exciting place to visit. Um, it's got loads of exciting scientific demonstrations to play with. I must admit I've noticed that the prism block behind our physicists today is actually splitting the light so that the bricks look almost rainbow, which is fantastic. Um, but we've really, really enjoyed having you um, join us today and ask us loads of really exciting questions. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Um, and we will maybe see you in the future in person. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Thank you.